Let's go ahead and get started. So, so welcome everyone to the Campfire Chat where we're, we're gonna talk about innovative technologies and solutions that address evolving high performance computing or HPC design and verification challenges. So ARM and Synopsys have been collaborating to enable your success for three decades now. And today I'm very excited to talk to you about how this collaboration is empowering the next generation of high performance, power efficient servers. So during the session, you're gonna have the opportunity to interact with us and ask questions. So to submit a question, uh, please type it in the box below the session video player on the event site, and then hit the yellow submit button, and then we'll, we'll be able to uh, see them. And, and the session's also being recorded. Okay, let me start by introducing you to the panel today. So let's start with Godwin. Uh, Godwin's a low power expert. At Synopsys, uh, Godwin's been instrumental in first time silicon deployments, and uh, uh, of deployment of various low power architectures, such as power gating, retention schemes, zero pin retention flops, well biasing, you know, and as well as, well as uh, DVFS, AVFS architectures. He's also defined many specifications for the automation of most low power sensitive designs. And he was heavily involved in the standardization process for UPF. Godwin's current research interests include accurate power analysis methodology, with a detailed focus on glitches to address the high demands of current data path oriented designs. Next up is Piyush. Uh, he's our verification expert. He leads a team in the United Kingdom that is engaged in the deployment of emulation and simulation technologies, verification IPs and verification methodology in collaboration with industry partners and custom, uh, customers, including ARM. And then we have Richard. Uh, Richard's an expert in all things PCI and connectivity IP in general. He's been involved in the deployment and development of PCI chips dating back to the NCR uh, 53C810 and even pre 1.0 versions of the PCI spec. Uh, Richard architected and led the deployment and development of the PCI Express and PCI X interface course uh, using an industry leading line of storage RAID controller chips. Uh, he served on the PCI SIG board of directors for over 15 years, and he continues to represent Synopsys on a wide variety of PCI work groups. And then finally, myself, uh, I'm Brian Millar. I'm in the ARM Solutions Group, ASG, at Synopsys, and, and I work closely with ARM and Synopsys R&D to improve advanced ARM core PPA uh, through flow methodology and native tool improvements. So with that, uh, please submit your questions. Okay, so uh, so these are questions now from anonymous users. So the first question uh, for Piyush, uh, what kind of hardware infrastructure is required to validate a complex HPC chip on ARM Neoverse platforms? Okay, yeah, so um, I, I'll take this question, yeah. So basically we need to first understand what are the challenges with ARM NeoServe processor when we are validating or verification uh, activities. So it's the sheer size, it's the high-speed IOs, it's the uh, computing infrastructure, and it's the reliability of the hardware. So when we, when we say that, this is where the large capacity emulation systems, such as Synopsys uh, Zebu Server 4, um, uh, comes in play, right? We are talking about speed in high megahertz to perform those high-speed IO activities and using the best-in-class simulation activity. Now, the reliability is very important because this is the content running 24 by seven. So we also need to take care the there is no hardware failure. So again, reliability, speed, and we're talking about uh, high megahertz. And we also need to ensure the, uh, the compliance test cases that are running continuously, uh, which again feeds to the point of the reliability again. So all in all, the synopsis emulation systems, they provide these capabilities and, uh, and kind of hardware infrastructure that are needed for, for validation of uh, Neoverse processors. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks, Piyush. And then I guess as a, as a follow-up, uh, how important is emulation in this context? Well, again, um, if you're talking about a high-speed input uh, your IO activities, right? This is where this is where the emulator takes uh, a continuous role. And again, we are talking about multiple scenarios, combination and permutation of various scenarios in a, in a 24 by seven uh, uh, system, right? And making sure there's no hardware failure, no corner case left and give uh, ease of debug debuggability, right? So this is where emulation has leapfrogged 
and and went um, um, you know matching simulation activity in terms of debug. So this is where the emulation plays a very critical role. You need the content uh, running 24/7, and you're addressing those uh, combination and permutation of all the scenarios with proper debuggability. And this is where the Synopsys uh, Zebu Server 4 is is a key uh, emulation technology to use in in these kind of scenarios. Okay. Okay, very good, Piyush, thank you. Um, okay, another question came in. Uh, a lot of analysis and optimization is done at many levels of abstraction, uh, for instance, software, operating system, all the way down to uh, process technology and silicon level. What if the predicted power savings is not achieved? Uh, silicon doesn't match what models and analysis predicted. Okay, so let me start. I could, I could answer that on the, uh, you know, on the, on the silicon side, and then we can see if uh, Piyush, Godwin, or Richard have other comments. So, so yeah, so this is a real difficult problem. I mean, you, you predict what you think the power is gonna look like in the system, and then you measure it in silicon, and, and it's, it's different than maybe what you predicted. And so this is obviously a difficult problem. Uh, what I would, one of the things I would say is, you know, you start going through the, the tape out uh, 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 process again, and you go look at all the log files, you make sure that, uh, you know, you dot your I, cross your T's, make sure that uh, you don't have any voltage power domain crossing issues, you know, that all that is really solid. You don't have any floating inputs, that sort of thing. So kind of go through some of the obvious things first. And then, you know, one thing is maybe the SPICE models that were built for the libraries, maybe they're stale and, you know, the process has been improved. So just make sure that you got the right version of the, of the process models in the libraries and so on that match the silicon. Um, or uh, you know maybe the silicon that you're measuring is uh, is in a different process window uh, than uh, what you uh, what you ran prime power to to predict what the power is going to be. You, you know you might be running tip tip models and maybe that particular silicon that you're looking at is slow slow or fast fast. So trying to understand what silicon you have in in, in hand uh, compared to you know what you predicted that's that's another thing. Um, Possibly you're getting higher static IR drop or dynamic drop as well um, than, than what you predicted. Uh, and, and maybe the, you have to run at a higher voltage to achieve the same frequency as a consequence. So check your voltage settings, make sure that uh, you know, hopefully you ran Red Hawk and you believe that the, the voltage drop is in good shape, but you know, look for signatures that maybe you're running at a higher voltage than you think you are, that your, your models you predicted. Um, is DVFS enabled in the system? In, in the lab when you're measuring the power, maybe DVFS is kicking in and again, you're running at a different voltage or, or, or you know, different mode in the system than you think you, you, you uh, predicted. Or, uh, you know, maybe the die is heating up temperature wise and the system's throttling back. So those are just kind of some things I would start with, I guess. And then, uh, you know, one thing that Synopsys has been working on that's really key to address these kind of complex things is the whole uh, silicon life cycle management. So that's a new uh, methodology and system that you know Synopsys is releasing, and uh, it's, it, it takes you know from design to manufacturing to test to silicon post uh, product bring up, and, and and mainly you know debugging in field operation, collecting a lot of data about the the system, and then being able to analyze that big data and, and, and spot trends, and then you would feed that back to possibly the next the next tape out. So. I think everyone in the industry recognizes that this is always a difficult problem. And so the silicon life management strategy, hopefully will be a, a good uh, a tool to, to address these kind of problems. So those are, those are some comments, I guess. Uh, let's see if, if others have comments. So Godwin, you're the, from a, you know, low power uh, uh, expert. Do, do you have any other comments that you might add to that? Oh, uh, thanks, Brian. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Cool. One of the basic things, we always look at all these complex things to check, but what I have seen is over uh, uh, many times, the power that is being measured using a vector, usually you simulate at certain frequency, whereas the, the, the timing constraints, what you write out, you over constraint for optimization, you start measuring power at the over constraint value, whereas your vectors which you are simulating, you are simulating at the right. So when I measure a power and look at that from a silicon perspective, did I scale my clock properly? Because you are measuring power at one frequency, but you are simulating at the other frequency. There is a conflict here. So in addition to what you explained, I would, uh, most of the time, the mistakes I have seen is 
the difference in frequency between where you measure, how you simulate. So I would add one more to that, to the list which you mentioned, Brad. Okay, okay, very good. How about you, Piyush, on the, on the verification side, any other um, angles that, that you have on this? No, I think this is this is pretty much you covered it well. So, okay, okay. And Richard, uh, how about you from a, a connectivity point of view? Uh, I, I, you know, I/O interfaces and so on. Any any comments you might add? Yeah, you know, actually, what's what's interesting about this when you look at HPC solutions in particular, the power for the whole system, or whether it's your SOC or the whole system, is very dependent on the workload. And it's really challenging to simulate workloads, right? We all kind of come up with some models of whether it's an intermix of storage reads versus writes or arithmetic versus memory transfers. Take a look at what's actually happening in your real system and see maybe it's not that your power methodology was wrong, just you didn't have the same conditions as you found in the real world. And, and I think that's kind of a common message we've all said, right? Which is go back and check your assumptions, but check them not just down at the tool and low level sense, but up in the whole system. Am I getting the kind of workloads that I was simulating here? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, obviously, like you said, the workload is so incredibly important here. And, and you know, and, and from a software point of view, you know, what software is running, you know, the workload isn't running the way you expect, are there errors in the software, you know, as well. So uh, yeah, kind of putting all that together, I guess. Is, is, is how we would attack that problem. Okay, so next question is kind of similar. Maybe it has a slight angle to it, so we'll see. Uh, meeting power targets in arithmetic heavy HPC systems is becoming ever more challenging. Uh, what advances are being made in the EDA and IP space to address this? So, um, I mean, kind of the same thing, arithmetic heavy HPC, that kind of goes to Richard, to your point about workloads. So, uh, you know, you've, you've addressed this from a workload point of view. Um, Godwin, does, do you see anything different from a low power point of view with an arithmetic heavy system compared to what we already answered in, in, as a general statement? Okay, so Brian, uh, the main thing uh, what we have seen is there are two aspects to it. One is the arithmetic component. And the second part is we are moving from uh, uh, seven nanometer to five nanometer to three nanometer. So, for as we scale down the process, you know that the wire delay dominates compared to cell delay. For example, even if I move from N5 to N3, my M1 resistance is four times more than uh, N5. Now, what this is, if I club this with the arithmetic component, for example, many of the AI accelerator chips, which is all about a lot of matrix multiplication and division and addition, you will see tons of multiplier accumulators. Now, if I take a look at multiplier accumulator, it's a lot of combinatorial logic with multiple levels, uh, 10 levels of combinatorial logic. So what this means is, if I have that many uh, combinatorial logic, wire delay being dominating, the arrival time at the input of the logic are going to be very different, which leads to the next big problem, which is what we call it as the glitches. You will see tons of glitches at the output of this combinatorial logic. These glitches are functionally not neat, doesn't going to make any difference, which gets killed at the sequential boundary. But still, since it's glitching, this is, contributes to power. Now, if you look at some of the chips I've worked recently, uh, total power, if you look at it, 27, 28, 30% of my power belongs to glitch. Now, going back to your first question, when I measure power in the silicon, you are going to get a number. Now, how do you separate the total power into what percentage is glitch and what is non-glitch? Right. So uh, it boils down to glitch is not easy because I need to identify how do I measure glitch and how do I validate that this glitch, what I'm measuring is going to be close to what I would see in silicon. And then how am I going to optimize this at every stage? For example, the best way to optimize glitch is to have an arithmetic component, which is glitch friendly or glitch tolerant. You would find tons of multiplier architectures or arithmetic components, which are glitch free. Uh, first step, what we do in Fusion Compiler, for example, 
if uh, you are at a lower geometry and you believe glitch is a dominant, going to be dominant because I have a lot of multipliers in my design, I would first go and uh, guide the tool to pick a glitch tolerant multiplier, adders, subtractors, and that's where I would start. Now, as we optimize the design, now wire delay is dominating because wire delay is dominating at a lower geometry, which means now I need to look at, find out various ways to uh, reduce the arrival time differences between the input of the gate. So we have technologies in place in the place and route and synthesis, which could look at glitch and try to balance the delay and minimize the glitch. So overall, it is about how do I measure? How do I make sure that I address from beginning all the way to the end? And also uh, the glitches are really visible only at the post route stage. You know for sure uh, the glitches are real glitches. Can I do something in the ECO phase? For example, prime ECO. Can I use this information in the ECO phase to adjust the delay such that I can optimize for glitch? So uh, overall, in an arithmetic uh, dominated design, glitch is becoming a bigger concern. And we have technology in place uh, throughout the flow. It has to be addressed from architecture all the way to final ECO to take care of the glitch. OK, thanks, Gavin. That's some great insight. Uh, yeah, that's very, very important. Uh, just a reminder to everyone uh, online, please submit your questions now. We got about uh, 10, 12, 13 minutes left. OK. Uh, next question, uh, I guess this is for you, Richard. Uh, for the HPC class design, uh, what are the connectivity trends and solutions that will enable enough data throughput to keep new breeds of advanced accelerators and CPUs busy? Well, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on these days. Uh, PCI SIG mm -hmm. just announced the PCI Express 6.0 spec. So now we've got 64 giga transfers per second, gigabits per second for most of us. Uh, out into kind of the, the normal space that, that SOCs would be implementing. We've got uh, CXL with an asymmetric coherency interconnect. Of course, C6 has been around for a while now with a symmetric coherency interconnect. So there's suddenly open standards for incredibly high bandwidth, PCI Express 5.0 and 6.0, and then building on top of that, these coherency protocols like C6 and CXL. So the accelerators are really getting some, some amazing ways to interconnect, whether it's different packages or different die within the package. So but an awful lot of this is, you know, this used to be the dream of supercomputers and, you know, folks like Cray were off doing proprietary ways to, to solve these problems. And now in the last few years, it's moved into the realm where you know, the average SOC designer has access to these technologies. So you really need to look at what would I benefit from? Don't necessarily just chase the latest and greatest. You know, we get lots of inquiries about that. Hey, I need to do PCI Express 6.0 because it just came out. Or I need to be doing CXL because I heard it just came out. Well, but if you don't need the coherence, then you don't want to mess with CXL or C6. Stick with PCI Express. So really look at the requirements for the SOC. Is it just bandwidth? Do you need coherence? If you need coherence, do you need it to be symmetric or can you handle asymmetric? And, you know, kind of do your research, talk to your IP partners, of course, and you know, get some guidance on, on what will fit you best there. Okay, yeah, good, good, Richard. Um, all right, on to the next question. Um, how are workloads being managed from software hardware into power analysis and optimization across the design flow? So I, I can I can start with them from the from the silicon tape out point of view. So when we go through the fusion compiler flow, you know, all the way from architecture exploration to uh, to tape out, uh, we try and get a a good mixture of uh, of uh, workloads as you know as Richard as you described it before, uh, either an FSTB or you know translated into a safe file. And then you know, we'll pull those in to our build flow and fusion compiler. And the trick, of course, is trying to pick the right mix of, of uh, you know, safe files for different workloads. Obviously, dry stone's a very favorite one. And you know, that's something that a lot of people use as a benchmark to compare power 
So, so that would certainly be one that we would consider. D d dry stone tends to be real integer uh, related, not really floating point. So we might pick another uh, benchmark uh, safe file as well that's, that's floating point. And then finally, uh, a lot of times like ARM, for example, will, will have a max power pattern uh, that they've artificially concocted to get as much activity in the design as possible. And that'll cover integer and uh, vector as well as you know, other types of scenarios. And so it's really good to have a, a small window like that, just uh, several cycles, you know, a d dozen, two dozen, three dozen cycles, not, not very long, and that we can uh, include along with maybe dry stone or a floating point pattern, like I said. And then in the Fusion Compiler Flow, it'll use the aggregate of all of those uh, safe file, those benchmarks to optimize the design. So as it looks at the nets and you know what nets are switching the most, it'll prioritize those nets higher and, and keep those nets uh, at lengths shorter or keep them on lower metal layers if possible to uh, you know lower capacitance layers. So putting all that together is is, is tend to how we tend to uh, how we tend to to go about this. And again, we're really dependent on the workloads coming in from you know, from ARM or whatever uh, uh, customer, you know, is using the ARM core. So, uh, yeah. Um, G Godwin, or, or uh, would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so uh, by the time you reach to Fusion Compiler, somebody would have sorted out the vectors and workloads and you've got these workloads, 10 workloads or five workloads. But if I go one step, shift left and move up, right? So picking the right workload uh, it's not about just the workload, it's the window from a workload. Which window? Right. Do I need to really look at 10 milliseconds or do I take one microsecond? Do I need 100 clock cycle? Do I need 10,000 clock cycle? So the best place to get first is accurate workload. So if you look at the overall development cycle, if I am onto an emulator and on an emulator with the entire software stack lined up, I run an application, in the emulator, uh, there is a, we have a technology called Zebu Empower, which primarily what it does is it looks at your entire cycle. Uh, uh, so when you run an application, even a one second application, that leads to billions of clock cycles. So in the re when it translates to your uh, five gigahertz clock, it's billions of clock cycle. And the amount of data, what you get for running a 10 second application, it's in terabytes. So uh, we, we have a technology called Zebu Empower built into an emulator. The idea here is out of this billions of clock cycle, how am I going to prune uh, millions? And then within the millions, how do I get to uh, millions of clock cycle? And then can I get to 100,000 clock cycle, which I could pass it onto an optimization tool and an analysis tool for optimization. So first is, uh, uh, work, correct workload to run and then converting that huge amount of data into a small amount of data and feeding that back to an optimization tool for optimization of the uh, for power. Like as you said, there are various techniques which looks at the switching activity and try to optimize for power, but getting the right activity is the key to get the best power out from the flow. Okay, very, very good, very good, Galen. Um before I move on to uh, the next question, uh, I just want to see Piyush if you had anything to add to that from a from a verification point of view. Um, uh, the Zebu Empower point was very important. How to reduce and prune the number of cycles for better analysis and passing on to the next tool chain for um, optimized results. So that's that's the good point. Um, good win raised. Okay, very good. All right, um, moving on. Uh, just a couple minutes left here. Um, so uh, a, a really important topic nowadays is, is obviously security. So um, what are some things being done at the hardware and system level to improve security? I, I guess you again, Godwin. Yeah, so thanks, Brian. So if you look at uh, security, I would uh, actually separate it into two different category. One is the safety and the other one is the security. Now, from a safety perspective, for example, if you take a look at all these autom autonomous uh, car and the way the system is built is, I cannot have a self-driving car running on a single chip. I need to have redundant element, redundant power supply, redundant chip itself, so that if one chip fails and the other chip takes over, 
have a, some amount of redundancy built at the system level. Now, if you go back to the design, SOC itself, uh, we have uh, tons of uh, safety mechanism that could be built into it. For example, triple, triple redundant registers. I could have something built into logic Vist to make sure that the hardware, random hardware failures are detected and fixed. So those are some things which are taken care along the flow from a safety perspective. Now, if I look at the security aspect of it, right? Uh, just uh, since we are moving uh, uh, 3D and you have multiple chiplets, now you have a TSV and an interprocessor. Now they have opened up a new channel for uh, hardware trojans to attack. So uh, that sacrifices the security of the chip itself. Now to address that, we have to, uh, we have taken care from the software all the way to the uh, final stage, which is we have a software integrity, which is uh, make sure that the software is secured. And then uh, while implementing the chip, we have implemented multiple uh, security IPs to guard the chip from any external attacks. And similarly, uh, DFTs and hardwares are in place, which will uh, make sure that if there is any failure, there is taken care of and the chip doesn't fail. So that way, okay. all the way from architecture to end, Brian. Okay, thanks, Godwin. Sorry, we're, we're, we ran out of time there. Uh, that'd be really good to, to spend more time. I know security is a really big topic. Uh, so um, we're, we're good. we'll take uh, we'll follow up on all the other questions that came in that, that we ran out of time on. So I'm just going to close with, uh, you know, you, if you had gone and, and seen our ARM Dev Summit uh, presentation, you know, we went through what Synopsys is high performance solution. These are all the different aspects of it and some more details. Please go see the, the presentation. Um, you could scan for uh, more information on the QRC symbol that we have here. Um, so thanks everybody for attending. And like I said, we'll follow up on the questions that we got that uh, we ran out of time on. So thank you for your attendance.